Hello and welcome to Round Robin. I'm your host, Robin McCormick, and today we're going to talk about two of Hampton's historic neighborhoods. And in fact, there's a special announcement that, that the two have been added to the National Register of Historic Places. My guests today are Amy Jordan from Economic Development. Welcome, Amy. Thank and you. she's going to talk a little bit about the city process and the process of this happening. And Mike Cobb from the Hampton History Museum. And he'll talk a little bit more about these neighborhoods and their history. So welcome to both of you. Thank to you. be here. This is a pretty big achievement, Amy, to get these two things added to the historic register. Can you tell us what the city did or, or how this, it's a pretty long process to get the history verified and recognized, right? Yes, it, it is. And it's very exciting for both of those neighborhoods um, and as well as for the city. Uh, we worked very Did close I name the neighborhoods? Why don't you tell us, for, let's start there first sure. of all, and have you tell us what the two neighborhoods are and what the rough geographic. The, the, the two neighborhoods that have now been added to the National Register of uh, Historic Places is Pasture Point, which is located about a half mile from the Central Business District of downtown along the Hampton River um, and, and Pembroke Avenue corridor. Uh, and then the second neighborhood is the Old With neighborhood, which is along the Kickatan corridor uh, from the city line up to uh, just past LaSalle Avenue and over to Chesapeake Avenue. That's a giant, giant it, neighborhood. It, I used to live there and I, and I know it very well. That's, um, that's a big neighborhood. It, it is. It's uh, over 500 acres, whereas the Pasture Point Historic District is approximately 28 acres. Uh, so very different in size. Uh, the, the Width neighborhood actually was about six different platted subdivisions mm -hmm. that over time have really come together as one neighborhood, one cohesive neighborhood. Uh, hence its size. Uh, but we worked very closely uh, with the uh, Department of Historic Resources from the state of Virginia and we actually did a cost share grant with them to originally do the nominations for these two neighborhoods. And that process started probably I think in 2008. Um, we were successful in wow. getting them on the state register. Um, there, there were a few issues that were identified with those nominations and so we went back to the state um, and worked with them again and they they agreed to to um, pay to complete the survey work so that we could get them both on the National Register. And so we're very excited that now both of them are on the National Register of Historic Places. And both of those do have pretty strong neighborhood associations. So those people, I assume, were involved and excited, right? They, they were. They were. They, they really know the assets of their community and know their communities very well. And so it's very exciting for them. And we are now working with those neighborhoods to help spread the information around so that people realize uh, the benefits of living in a history historic district. Well, I want to get back to the benefits in a minute, but let's talk about the history first. And let, let's start with Pasture Point. What makes that a, a, a unique or historic area? Pasture Point is special. And for one reason, it's right in the, in the middle of, of Old Hampton. And when I say Old Hampton, I mean 17th century Hampton, when Hampton was first settled uh, in 1609, 1610. This was the area that the English settlers they built their forts along the waterfront, mm -hmm. and they moved from the water into where uh, downtown Hampton is today. And Pasture Point is one of those areas where people built their domestic settings, and one of which was fairly close was the Thomas Jarvis site, where Pintran bus station is today. We've excavated that. But between uh, Jar the Jarvis site and Pasture Point, there are other domestic settings uh, very, very early in the first decades of, of settlement. One of the things I find interesting about Pasture Point is that after the Civil War, many of the old Southern families, uh, the Holtzclaws and, and others, uh, settled there and built their homes there, while newcomers, many people who came from the North, tended to build their houses along what is today Chesapeake Avenue and Victoria Avenue. So you had this enclave of really the Old South and Pasture Point. Old Whiff. Old Whiff is named for George Whiff. Mm -hmm. and he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and teacher of Thomas Jefferson and framer of the American Constitution. So his name is connected with this very, very important neighborhood by the sea. One of the houses that's always interested me is a little cottage, cottage right there on the water that Conrad Wise Chapman lived in in the last year of his life. He came here in 1910. And he, had, he was in hard times, but as a young man, he was a very famous painter. In fact, he was the best known painter in, this, in, the, Confe in, the, in the Confederacy. He painted many of the pictures of Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie down in Charleston. Oh. Most any Civil War book will have his pictures. 
And uh, as he got older, he fell on hard times, and he came here without, without any money, and he used to paint uh, portraits for food. And in fact, I knew a lady, Louisa Scott, who he actually painted. Louisa lived in Pasture Point on Marshall Street, a Booker family. So Conrad Wise Chapman lived in the Wiff District and today is buried in St. John's Church. Really unknown, but nationally, one of the most famous people associated with Hampton. Interesting, I didn't know that. Now Wiff, I mean, both of these areas were developed along the waterfront, obviously. Mm -hmm. They go in a little bit, yes. but the waterfront being where people wanted to uh -huh, live for commerce and beauty and recreation and everything. But wasn't there also a, a Wyth would have not been in the city of Hampton at the time. No. It would have been in Elizabeth City County. Correct. What, um, wh what facilitated the development of that area? Well, the, the Pasture Point area uh, really was born around the streetcar. Um, actually, the, the land uh, was owned by the Old Dominion um, Land Company, who did, uh, the, of course, the Newport News the Shipyard, shipyard right. and owned thousands of acres through the peninsula, and responsible for so much of the development that you see today. Uh, and they had built a train depot there uh, near the location of Pasture Point. Um, that was in the late 1800s, and development slowly started to take off just a little bit. But then once the streetcar came in, you really saw development open up in Pasture Point because you had these connections. Now, see, I didn't realize that. I knew there was one in Wyth, but in Pasture point I mean you're kind of walking distance from downtown you why did you need a streetcar well well it you know there there weren't a don't believe as many residents living at downtown at the time until you saw the streetcar introduced and then you started to see a lot of these neighborhoods start to develop around the downtown uh, it, it provided connections to Phoebus and to Old Point Comfort, to Buckrow, and then also to downtown Newport News, uh, where there was tremendous commerce with the shipyard that was growing and at the time. And they needed workers. And they needed workers. Um, so you saw that development. Uh, Wyth is a little bit similar in that regard because it did have the rail lines and the streetcar that ran through it. Uh, however, its period of significant significance extends really beyond that streetcar development. Uh, in Pasture Point, once the streetcar started to die off and the automobile took over, you really saw development slow down. Uh, and with it really continued because Kickatan Roads became a major automobile corridor connecting downtown Newport News to downtown Hampton. So its period significance, although it begins in the 1800s, really extends to the mid-1950s. A lot of those homes are post-war. Some, some were before that, but certainly it boomed. Well, well it's, a, it's a mix. It's a real mix. And so um, you, you have um, a, a tremendous amount throughout the year, but you continue to see that development occur. And then it wasn't until the, uh, the, the interstate development that you saw development patterns shift, and that's when things really started to slow down in, in the width area. So what, um, what would the width area have looked like in the streetcar days? You've seen pictures and read a lot about it. Well, I, th I think the closer to Old Hampton you were, the grander the houses were. Uh, many of the people who made money in the seafood industry and, and um, uh, uh, businesses in downtown Hampton lived along that, along that corridor. And probably in between here in Newport News, it probably uh, was, a, was a bit simpler than probably as you got closer to Newport News, it would, the houses would increase in, in, in grandeur. Uh, but, but certainly it would have been quite exciting to see the streetcar come rumbling through and clanging down the tracks and such. And, and where did it run? Did it run along what is now Chesapeake or was it further back? Uh, down, down Victoria. Down Victoria, Avenue, oh, okay. Which I used to call Electric Avenue for appropriate reasons. And ah. um, so uh, that, was the, that was the connection. If you drive from, from where the uh, Yacht Club is today on the, mm -hmm. on the water all the, way down. all the way to Newport News, uh, just imagine those being fields for the most part until the trolley line comes and these houses spring up just as today, as Amy mentioned, the interstate, as the interstates are built in rural areas in Virginia and other parts of the country today, very soon thereafter interchanges come up and businesses spring up and hotels and such. So the trolley lines in, in, in the earlier day did the same thing, encouraged development. And what was that time period? Early 1900s, Roughly. early okay. 1900s, and, and it's also a time when you, you think of people's dress as being very grand and stately right. and such, and, and you're in the Victorian era with, with, with mannerisms that, that accompany that. And there was a lot of Victorian architecture in, mm -hmm. especially Pasture Point, I'd say, but also in width, it's just a little more scattered. It's not as... 
the concentrate. They both have a very eclectic mm -hmm. mix of homes, and that's really what makes both of these neighborhoods very unique. Um, very defined architecture from the periods, but 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 well mixed. Um, there are even some homes um, in both neighborhoods, but I think you especially in Pastor Point that it's hard to identify it as one type of house because it incorporates so many different details um, from popular building construction methods of the period. And the integrity of both neighborhoods has been so well preserved and that's what made them excellent candidates to be on the National Register of Historic Places. And that's what's so nice uh, about WIF. I mean, the, the expanse of it for one thing. Wow. And these broad streets, Allegheny and others, that you can walk to, to, to the water and look across Hampton Roads Harbor and look over where the Monterey and Virginia fought and look at the, across the water to Norfolk Naval Base and the expanse of, of Hampton Roads Harbor. And the homes themselves, so eclectic as Amy says, and reminds me of the neighborhoods that I grew up in in, in, in Norfolk. And it has that feeling that I think is timeless, that generations of young families will come have, and have the, uh, grow their families and, and grow old in. And it's a very pleasant place. I will say that's one of the things, and I'm more familiar with WIF because I go to the pool and, and went to school. My kids went to school at yeah, Armstrong, yeah. and you know we're kind of neighborhood mm -hmm. association members. But you, you do see that generations. I mean, a friend of ours lives yes. down the street from her parents' mm -hmm. home, and their you know kids are going to grow up and. and and there's also those established organizations, the, the Recreation Association with the pool, the Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts, I mean, all of those, the Re uh, Little League, basically all celebrated their 50th anniversary about, it was eight or 10 years ago, but it was all the same year because you can tell when that neighborhood really came together and developed all of those kind of social amenities and organizations. They, they, they both really are sustainable neighborhoods in a way um, because of what they have around it and they've really created this sense of community. And with, for example, because it has such a mix of homes from very small bungalows and cottages mm -hmm. and Cape Cods all the way to these very large grand homes. dollar homes on the waterfront, <laughs> I know. And, and they're, they're so intermixed. Yeah. So, so the, the, the population, the demographics, the age are all very intermix and it makes for a really healthy neighborhood mm -hmm. and they're both walkable neighborhoods you know you can walk oh, not very yeah. far and you're along the water and those streets run along the water you've got all those views I mean it is a place where I think it, it's a lot of accessibility by bike and walking and all those things the community plan encourages us to do and, and get out and enjoy. And, and Pastor Point, I know, really appreciates their proximity to downtown for that very reason. Oh my gosh, yeah. You could walk to City Hall in a heartbeat if you <laughs> live there, it'd be very handy. And the WIF area has had that feel that we have discussed from the very beginnings of time. The Virginia Indians lived there. A lot of, most artifacts found here are found in the WIF area. Oh, really? Yeah. And also, one of the early Virginia, Virginia Company, early English settlements, one of the earliest structures found uh, here in the Lower Peninsula was found in the WIF area in 1941. And it uh, was undoubtedly an uh, early settler who branched out from the uh, uh, foothold of Fort Henry and Charles and established uh, uh, a homestead on the west bank of the Hampton River, one of the earliest remnants of early Hampton. Wow, Earth. approximately where would that be? Do you, uh, will you be able to it's pin it It's approximately where Armstrong Avenue is, and we actually we know exactly where oh, it okay. is. Oh, okay, okay. And we have pictures of the excavation, and one day you might, might be able to go back and take a look and see what else is still there. But both of these neighborhoods, uh, even though you see most of the residential structures are from the late 1800s and early 1900s, the, the land itself and the stories they tell really span 400 years of not just Hampton history but American history. Mm -hmm. And they're both very proud of that. If you look back to the original land deeds and grants that were awarded and structures that were there through the years, churches or plantation homes or other, other, other important you know, events that occurred within those areas and those properties and, um, you know, with, for example, used to have a golf course there and um, had a president come and play at the golf course. And so um, just, you know, very interesting stories that these neighborhoods tell through the years. Uh, and, and again, it's not just Hampton's history, but a lot of this is American America's history. And that mm -hmm. expansion starts in the 17th century, the first days of colonization. The two forts, Henry and Charles, are built about where Hampton University is today. And very soon thereafter, the settlement started 
branching out towards the other end of the peninsula where Newport News is today. It started in the very first days of, of the presence of, of uh, English in this area. And that is sort of that direct line mm -hmm. between downtown Hampton or, or Fort Monroe or, you know, that more developed area along the waterfront to downtown Newport News and where the commer a lot of the other commerce um, would begin with the shipyard and the rail line. And American things. history is about moving west, from the east to the west, and it starts here in the very beginning when those first steps are taken away from the, from the uh, coast here, moving towards the west, that's the, that's, that's the nutshell that is the uh, epic of American history. That's great. Well, so, Amy, what does it do for a neighborhood? Suppose I'm a homeowner in with what, other than a sense of pride, maybe, what does it mean that, that my neighborhood is on the National Register? Well, that, that is a great question. And that sense of pride is very important and often can play into property values, uh, which, is, which is great, a way to sort of market your neighborhood um, to, to people looking at different communities that want to be there. Um, a, a National Register Historic District does not have any restrictions on it as far as what you can do with your home. You can still do replacement windows, you, you can which do, I know can be a, a difficulty in an older yes, home. Yes, it's not, it's not um, something that, that is, is, is favored upon from a historic preservation standpoint, but it is something that you, you, know, you, you have the ability to do what you want with your neighborhood um, and with your home, your property. Um, what it does open up is an opportunity for tax credits. Uh, for those, because these are residential neighborhoods, most of the structures are owner-occupied. Uh, and for those that are owner-occupied, they can qualify for uh, state tax credits for being on the state registry. Um, for those that are uh, maybe income producing properties, they can also qualify for federal tax credits and the total for both is uh, up to 45%. It's 25% for the state for your investment and wow. qual qualifying investment of improvements and 20% for the federal. So um, if there's a property that is going through a, a, a major restoration and major renovation, that is something that uh, really can can promote investment in a community. Now, if you're just putting on a new roof or doing some minor improvements, it's probably not something that you would take advantage of. Um, but if you're looking at doing major renovation work and restoration work, then it is definitely something uh, for homeowners to explore. Um, and how would they do that, Amy? Who would they contact? Um, the, the Department of Historic Resources is okay. really, um, for the state of Virginia, is really the best place to start. Um, and, and oftentimes I recommend that homeowners homeowners probably work with a um, architectural historian. There is an application process that, that, that needs to be done and oftentimes it's it's best if you're working with somebody that's been through that before and it's can a help complicated walk, you, and right, specialized. Walk, walk, walk you through it. So, uh, But it is something that, um, you know, is, is, is it does create a sense of pride in neighborhoods and as far as the preservation piece, um, we do encourage that these homeowners retain as many of their the original character um, and original materials of their home as possible because it, even though currently we have a lot of historic integrity in these neighborhoods, if you start to lose too much of that, you could right. potentially lose your historic district status. So encouraging the neighbors to, first of all, know and understand and appreciate a little bit of the history of where they live so that we don't lose that, but also to keep that character in the housing, in the you know big old trees along those streets, along what used to be called the boulevard, right? Or was that right. just in the Newport News Park? It's the boulevard, it's a timeless place and keeping these structures in character is priceless and not only for those of us who live today, but certainly for future generations. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you both for coming by today and telling us this story. Thank I really you. appreciate Good to be it. Here. And don't forget, you can, you can drive by or walk through these neighborhoods and also in Pasture Point and also in With, appreciate the um, architectural beauty and the strong neighborhoods um, and people and networks that they have. Thank you for watching.